Hi, my name is Tim Essington. I'm a professor at the University of Washington School of Aquatic and Fishery Sciences, and I've created this short video today to help provide you a framework for thinking about how does reduction in oxygen affect aquatic life. If you're watching this video, I'm sure you're aware that there is concern that human activities are causing a reduction in the amount of oxygen that's available to fish and invertebrates, uh, particularly in Puget Sound right now. And what I hope this video does is provide a framework that allows you to sort of evaluate evidence put forward to you uh, and claims that are put forward to you uh, about when and where would some of these reductions in oxygens likely to have an adverse ecological impact. Um, I'm going to start, well first I'm going to say is that um, I'm not going to show graphs from papers. Uh, I'm not going to show detailed equations except for this horrendogram which I, I pulled together. Um, but rather instead I'm going to talk about three principles that I think you can apply to start thinking about evidence presented to you about when and where oxygen is likely to uh, be problematic for aquatic life. And my main take home point or theme of this entire presentation is that not all oxygen depletion is the same, at least from the perspective of being, say, a fish or a um, invertebrate that lives in Puget Sound or like Washington, you name it. Um, uh, there are a lot of dimensions to oxygen depletion that will govern whether or not that has an adverse effect on that organism or effect on the broader ecosystem. So I'm going to present these as, as three core principles. So I'll, I'll present them, describe them, and then at the end show how you can apply those three principles together to evaluate vulnerability. So principle one. Principle one is that low oxygen is only problematic when the oxygen level surpasses some threshold. Now, what are those thresholds? It varies an awful lot by species, but let's just take us, humans, for example. Say you're watching this video, maybe on your laptop in your home, maybe in your office, and there's plenty of oxygen. There's far more than, they, than you actually need. Now, if let's say there might be a 10% reduction in oxygen, maybe your room gets really crowded and there's a lot of people breathing heavily and they're causing a, a, a lowering of oxygen. Because you started at a place where there is plenty of oxygen, you're probably not even going to notice that 10% reduction. And the reason why you're not noticing that 10% reduction is because it wasn't enough to push oxygen levels low enough to a point where your body starts having trouble. Now let's pretend you're not, instead of watching this video in the comfort of your office or in your home, let's say you're halfway up Mount Everest. And I never climbed Mount Everest, but I suspect right around halfway is probably where oxygen is getting really, really, really limiting. That's right about the point where it's probably just barely enough for you to be able to move um, and uh, still retain all of your cognitive functions. Now, if there's a 10% reduction in that environment, that's a huge problem for you. So when you start thinking about reductions, think about the reductions is, is it going to pass some threshold beyond which an organism is gonna have challenge, challenges, it's gonna have challenges in coping with that, with that new oxygen level. Um, all oxygen problems are threshold problems. Okay, that's principle one. Principle two. Is even once exposed to that threshold, oxygen's uh, organisms have a range of responses available to them to try to cope with the fact that they're now below that threshold of the amount of oxygen that they would like to have available to them. And the first one is an obvious one, is that if an animal has the capacity to move, it will move. And we see a lot of evidence of that, for instance, in Hood Canal. In Hood Canal, um, typically what happens is oxygen becomes very depleted uh, towards the end of the summer. And that oxygen depletion happens at the southern end of Hood Canal and happens at the deepest parts of the southern end of Hood Canal. 
So what do organisms do that are otherwise inhabiting that area is, well, they leave. Uh, and they le could leave in one of two ways. Is One is they might just go north to try to get out of that whole region. And we do see some evidence that that's, in fact, how some fish respond. Uh, or you simply might change how deep you are living. And we see evidence that crabs do that, for instance, that they basically just kind of move up into the shallows uh, to try to avoid that area that has very, very low oxygen. Now, this is not to say that just because they can move, it doesn't mean there's necessarily some bad outcome. Like, presumably, they were in that spot in the first place because that's where they wanted to be. Uh, but it doesn't mean they're just going to straight up die like that just because the oxygen exceeds their threshold. They're going to do, start doing some things to try to minimize their, their exposure. The other thing they're going to do is, this is a school of herring. Uh, what herring and other animals can do is they have an immense capacity to acclimate. In other words, uh, adopt physiological changes to cope with this new level of oxygen. So it might be um, the, the, the structure of the gill itself will change to make it more efficient at pulling oxygen out of the water. The blood uh, composition itself will change to enable it to be more effective at grabbing that oxygen and then delivering it on to the rest of the fish tissue. And in fact, we can go into places again like Hood Canal and we can actually detect the bio biochemical responses that fish have in response to the exposure to the low oxygen. While at the same time, when we're out there sampling those fish, we see no evidence that they are under any particular type of stress. They are have, have full bellies, um, they're, they're kicking around, uh, they're doing all the things you expect to, see, expect to see a healthy fish do. Over many, many generations, uh, you might start to see evolution. Uh, so a particular species of fish or perhaps uh, a segment of a particular species of fish that lives in a particular environment might start um, uh, just evolving the capacity to deal with low dissolved oxygen. And again, I'll stick with my old favorite Hood Canal. In Southern Hood Canal, there is a lot of Pacific hake or Pacific whiting, if you prefer that word. And those animals just can see, seemingly live in extremely low oxygen levels. And it's not surprising because throughout their reigns, they live in areas that regularly have very low oxygen levels. And then finally, the last response is the one that we want to avoid, which is uh, death. Um, so death kind of happens when animals are unable to adopt any of those other coping mechanisms. And in fact, when we look at some of the fish kill events that have happened, or um, that, not even just fish kill, but any type of uh, kill, killing of marine life that happened due to low dissolved, low dissolved oxygen, it's often happened because the change in oxygen happened extremely abruptly, like in a matter of hours, so that organisms didn't have the capacity to move uh, or mount some sort of physiological ability to deal with that new condition. Okay, so that was principle two. Principle three now is it matters when and where oxygen is depleted. And the way I want to express this is just take a particular species and just tell the story of that species. So here's a salmon, technically it's a sockeye, but let's just pretend for the time being it's a chum salmon and that's the chum salmon that happens to be wandering into Karki Creek in order to spawn. This is happening um, in our early autumn in most years. Uh, it's spawning, it's depositing its eggs in the stream bed and then burying those eggs in the stream bed. So those eggs are living in the bottom of Karkik Park um, in late summer throughout the winter. Now, uh, those eggs require the delivery of water to go into the stream bed. That water needs to move through the stream bed, pass over the eggs, and deliver fresh oxygen to them. Otherwise, they're going to suffocate because they're, they're buried. So um, the overall amount of oxygen that's in Karkik Park in that period of time really, really matters to the survivorship of those eggs because if the overall amount of oxygen drops down, that seepage of water in through the stream bed might be insufficient to allow those eggs to stay above those thresholds where they can stay alive. Now, the timing here is really critical because if there's a very, very low oxygen that happens in, say, August, 
that obviously is not going to impact eggs that are only present much later in the year. So that this that illustrates the timing phenomenon I was talking about. Now let's take um, salmon again. Um, again, these are probably these also are not chum, but migrating out into Puget Sound. While they are in Puget Sound, they are inhabiting very shallow water. Very shallow water is typically extremely well oxygenated. So for these salmon that are hanging out in the top, gosh, say 15, 20 feet of water, it really doesn't matter to them at all that hundreds of feet below them resides really, really, really low oxygen water because they're not there. So the, the spatial um, uh, overlap of where the organism is and where the oxygen is low is incredibly important. Uh, we're not going to see a mass die off of salmon that are at the surface because the bottom water is depleted in oxygen. That's not the way it works. And then similarly, if there would happen to be perhaps a rapid intrusion of that deep water, uh, low dissolved oxygen into the surface waters, um, that would not be problematic for salmon if it happened after the salmon had already migrated through. So again, the time and place where oxygen passes the thresholds is incredibly, incredibly important. Okay, so now I presented these three principles that thresholds really matter. It's all about exceeding thresholds. Um, that even once uh, thresholds are exceeded, that organisms have a wide range of responses and it's only when all those other responses are exhausted that you start seeing the most severe ecological consequence, which is death. And then finally, it is the, the overlap in time and space of when that oxygen depletion is happening relative to where the organism happens to be residing really matters. So how can you put all those three principles together to predict vulnerability? So vulnerability is simply that those three things that I've sort of talked about is one is what's the risk that an organism is going to experience oxygen below a threshold. By experience, meaning it's overlapping in time and space. So there's some critical habitat need that is uh, now going to have an oxygen level that is no longer hospitable. Is it going to exceed the ability of that organism to cope with that scenario through either the behavioral moving um, or the physiological, so the gills and the blood, things like that. Um, and then um, finally, is it happening in the right time and place uh, for it to affect that particular organism? When that happens, that's when we get really, really worried about particular species responding to uh, responding very, very negatively to reduce the dissolved oxygen. So that's what I want to provide to you is that framework. Uh, I hope this is a useful tool for you to start thinking about the types of evidence and claims that are brought forward to you about the types of risks and threats that lower dissolved oxygen poses to the marine life of Puget Sound. Thanks.